Hey everyone, I just wanted to make a quick little fun tutorial because this morning I was messing around with Houdini trying to make some fun effects partially to help a friend and partially because I just got distracted going down a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, and I figured it'd be fun to share this knowledge with the general public through making it into just a fun little YouTube video. Um, so I'll just sort of dive in and show you what I did. First off, I was trying to help a friend answer a question of how do you do essentially a particle sim where you don't have, where you're kind of generating trails and you're not having these particles kind of intersect with one another. And there was lots of thinking about, you know, different ways to do it, maybe using a SOP solver and trying to relax the points so that they don't collide together each iteration, maybe using grains to cause collisions during the sim, but then that resulted in the issue of, but then, uh, you know, a particle could theoretically intersect with the trail of another particle that was left behind or its own trail because it's not aware of the previous particles that aren't being left behind during the sim. And I thought about how would we maybe leave them behind during the sim and, or, or, or create colliders on the fly out of them. And I couldn't quite figure out like a great solution but then I had the thought of maybe this doesn't need to be a sim, uh, you know, because this is sort of how curl noise behaves. Like if you just look at curl noise examples here, um, they kind of have this behavior of uh, being divergence free, um, meaning that they are kind of rather than uh, coming together and um, kind of compressing in certain areas or expanding in certain areas, they're kind of swirling around each other and not really colliding with one another. So it kind of results in this velocity field that is kind of nicely organized in a way where um, everything just kind of keeps swirling around each other and you don't end up with uh, any kind of points where things are getting sucked together or, or where they're intersecting. So I thought maybe that could be a good solution. And then, uh, so my thought was, okay, um, let's take the sim that we are doing here to generate the, uh, you know, the trails that we have that we don't want to have any um, kind of intersection with. And let's use that to make a velocity that we can then remove any of the divergence from through doing this sort of project non-divergence step, which is like a common thing that happens in fluid simulations. Um, and I'm not gonna pretend to be like the expert on this, but um, I think I like vaguely have a rough understanding of how it works. And I, and I thought this might work and it resulted in some of these pretty cool results. So let me just show you how that worked. So um, first what we do is we just do a particle sim, you know, uh, basically in here, what I did was I simulated a bunch of particles and I forced them to stay on the uh, X plane um, or sorry, the, the, uh, the YZ plane by just setting the X position every single frame to be zero. Um, and I did like a pop a track so they would kind of all swirl in the same area rather than expanding out too much and just had like a pop force to kind of create some noise and a pop drag for good measure. Um, and then that resulted in this. Um, and then from here, I figured I could generate velocity through using the volume velocity from curves node. Um, and real quick, just so it's clear, uh, this trail SOP here, this is just going back and creating these crazy trails. Um, and I figured I'd just like freeze this on frame 120. Uh, and then with this add SOP over here, I'm able to set it to polygons and by group and then by attribute and then use the ID attribute to connect all the points that have the same ID attribute. So you end up with these trails. You can also use something like the, um, I believe there's a new spark trail node in, uh, in Houdini 19 that was added. Um, but uh, this is a little bit slower and, and a little bit overkill for what we're trying to do. So um, I just went ahead and used the good old trail and add SOP combination that I was used to using before the Spark node came out. Um, so anyway, then I use this volume velocity from curves node, which is super handy. 
which uh, creates a velocities, um, a velocity field. You can see it's a, it's a, a XYZ vector three volume VDB fields here um, from those curves. And so the, the, if you just feed it in curves, uh, it doesn't work because it needs sort of a volume to create the volume within. Um, so what I did was I just made a bounds of that area and I gave it some padding and stuff um, and then plugged that into this surface input. Um, and default uh, this, if we look at a volume slice of it, um, by default, this doesn't have fill interior turned on. And you can see as a result of that, it only is basically creating this volume on the surface. So you need to turn on fill interior. So you get all those interior bits and stuff. Um, and then you get sort of a nice velocity VDB. I also just set the voxel size of this to something a little bit more dense. And I turned on smooth velocities, which maybe isn't necessary. I'll turn that off um, and we'll get something a little bit rougher. Um, but setting it down to 0.01 is cool. And then uh, from here, you can look at the volume trail by plugging in the points that you want to trail on the left side, which we'll just use this grid. This grid has plenty of points on it. Um, and you bring in that velocity uh, volume on the right side. Um, and it creates these, these kind of messy trails where you see lots of bits are kind of uh, there's some divergence and there's things kind of coming together and 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 um, it's 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 looking a bit messy and it doesn't look like it's going to give us that kind of result that we want of things being kind of nicely separated and all that. So if you look at what divergence is, you can find on this useful Khan Academy article um, what divergence is and sort of how it relates to like fluid simulation and stuff. Um, but basically, the idea of divergence is essentially you have negative divergence here in areas where uh, things are being kind of compressed and coming together, and you have positive divergence in areas where things are sort of expanding. So for example, if you wanted to create like a sort of expansion in like an explosion with a pyro simulation or something, you could add divergence to your sim in certain areas and it would like sort of expand out from those, those spots. Um, but with fluid simulation, so pyro or flip, uh, part of the key kind of, one of the key concepts to it is that we are treating these fluids as being incompressible. So you don't wanna have any negative di divergence, for example. So, um, you know, if you think about like a fluid, like, you know, fluids are gonna kind of swirl around each other and they're not going to kind of compress infinitely into a small, little spot in your glass where you have the fluid, you know, or it would, it would disappear and the, the mass would increase in that area and it just it sort of breaks physics. Um, and I think, don't quote me on this, I think like technically fluids can be compressible, um, but it's sort of an assumption that we make in simulations and computer graphics that they are incompressible and that allows us to simulate them um, by just removing any kind of divergence on every step that you're solving it. Um, so that's just sort of a, a, a nice thing to kind of keep in mind and you know, can kind of help some of this stuff make sense and help you understand how fluid simulations and stuff work. And I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that this type of stuff is not just used for simulating CG fluids, but it's also used for things like predicting weather patterns and stuff like that. So it's sort of a very broadly applicable um, sort of way of going about you know, simulating fluids and, and uh, you know, gas and liquids and, and, and all that good stuff. Going back to Houdini then for a second, if we look in here for, at our, our nasty sort of velocity grid, uh, what we can do is we can use this really handy VDB project non-divergent node, which is just a SOP node. Um, and I can plug the velocity volumes into that uh, in order to kind of see what that does um, to our velocities and all that. Um, so it's calculating, it kind of takes a second, um, but then you can see we end up with this kind of much nicer looking uh, velocity grid where all these different kind of things are swirling around each other, kind of creating that more fluid-like behavior.
Um, so that's great. So we have this new velocity over here that's been modified. Um, there's some settings on the project non-divergent uh, node that you can mess with, including the iterations and the tolerance, and you can output pressure, which I um, I don't know exactly what that would do. I think that would have something to do with uh, measuring the areas where um, there's more negative divergence or something. I, I actually have, have no idea. I could be totally wrong about that. I've got to kind of wrap my head around some of that stuff more. But anyway, I'm able to generate a velocity grid from that um, using that initial velocity grid that was a lot messier, and we get this kind of cleaner velocity grid. It's a little bit nicer. Um, and then in a volume wrangle, I just multiplied it by 0.1 just to make the velocity a little bit less intense. Um, and uh, that's sort of all that there was to generating this uh, divergence-free velocity grid. Um, so then just drop a null for you know a good measure. And then back over here with our original sphere, what I did was I, I just sort of flattened it out. I set the the x value to zero, just like I did in the solver of that initial sim. Um, and then I just scattered a bunch of points onto it, so they scattered nice and evenly. Um, and then in this pop network over here, uh, what we're gonna do is plug the velocity into the second input here, and then we're literally just using a pop invec by volumes node here to uh, push the particles around, you know, just like you would invect particles by a pyro sim or any other kind of um, you know, way that you would affect particles uh, by uh, velocity uh, in the form of velocity grids or, or volumes. Um, and then the other thing that I did here real quick is I set this advection type to just update position. I've just found this to be by far the most reliable way of advecting particles. Um, if you want them to follow the shape of the velocity that you're feeding into it as closely as possible. If you want this to behave more just like a force and you're gonna be adding other forces in, you may wanna use update force instead, but I use update position um, and I'll do that a lot of the times when I just wanna get a lot of the motion from the velocity that I'm feeding into it rather than generating it in this simulation. And you end up with this like really nice swirly motion here. Um, so this is like pretty sweet. And you can get a much better sense of how sweet it is if we trail it out just like we were before. And you can see kind of how these trails move around. And, and you get some, some really cool results, kind of curl noisy, but this was made kind of using a custom setup, which is, which is pretty sweet. So this is a pretty sweet result, but uh, you can see if you're, if you're curious, um, if you turn off that project non-divergent step that we're doing, uh, what you end up with is this much uh, kind of crappier result where um, you know the particles they do compress and they do kind of get stuck together in certain areas and things and that is not what you want in a fluid like simulation um, and you know in a fluid sim where the velocities are moving around there's all this noise and stuff that project non divergent step is happening every single frame during the sim. In this case, we're just making this grid once and then we're infecting everything kind of through here. You can kind of get a sense for like the benefit of doing this sort of project non-divergence step in order to kind of help smooth out some of this motion and, and get this nice kind of swirly behavior. And you could feed any other kind of curves into here to create this. Like you could totally just do a draw curve and project it on the um, YZ plane, and I'll just feed this into here instead. I'll just draw, I don't know, some curves around and, um, you know, we'll make it kind of messy. Um, but you can like feed totally custom stuff into it. Um, like I just did here and then project non-divergent to kind of fix all the, the messy bits you'll end up with a nice, cool, flowy result again, like this. So that's cool. It's a lot like curl noise, but it's kind of a little bit more kind of uh, custom and controllable on your own. Um, so that that's pretty sweet. Um, but then, you know, like what else could we do with this? Well, I was playing with it in a solver 
um, and I was using the uh, VDB advec points, which you can use um, in a solver to, uh, instead of like using a pop network here um, and doing this with a pop advec by volumes, you could just make a brand new solver, plug the velocity into the second input and plug the particles into the first input. And then in here, you just do BDB advec points, and we can advec these points every frame by this VDB that's uh, plugged into um, the second input. And uh, I'll just set the velocity VDB to specify that it's using VEL, um, and then we'll get a very similar result again. In fact, it may even be identical. Um, if we switch between here and here, I think we'll see it's actually, it's, it is literally exactly identical. Um, so that's cool. Um, I think you could also just add this trail onto here. Um, and then this won't work because it doesn't have an ID attribute, but if we just do a point wrangle and we give it an ID attribute just by saying I at ID equals I at PT num, because that's how it generates that attribute. Then we do this, and then you can see again, we have exactly identical results on the left and the right side, whether we're using a solver or we're using a, a pop net. So pretty sweet. Um, so that that's all cool. And the, the VDB advec points is a handy node to know about, especially if you're doing, you know, uh, SOP solver things with particles and stuff. Um, but what else could you do with uh, this um, handy knowledge? Well, you could advect uh, SDFs also, because SDFs will advect by velocity grids if you use a um, a VDB advec node, and you can plug into the left side here the velocity. No, sorry, the, the left side here you plug in the VDB, the SDF, and then uh, the right side you plug in the velocity, um, and you can see. Uh, I think if you turn up the substeps or you play with the substeps here, maybe it won't really do anything. But uh, we should probably set it to use this velocity. Um, well, it's specifying now at least that it's advecting the surface by the velocity. So that's good. Um, and uh, you can do um, some fun stuff with this if you put it in a solver just like we, we just had. So I'll go ahead and plug this guy here, plug this guy here, and then once again, I will um, invect this guy by this one, and we'll just hit play, and then we get this nice swirly advection happening of our SDF along this uh, curly noise that we've made, um, this velocity grid. So that's kind of cool. Um, but there's definitely more fun stuff you can do with this. And I've been sort of inspired by seeing other cool growth setups people have made. I gotta give a big shout out to Ian Farnsworth, who I remember made this really cool recursive growth setup. Um, and he shouted out E2, who helped him on the Odd Force forums. Um, but you can see you get, you know, this really kind of cool behavior here if you kind of know what you're doing with messing with um, the uh, SDF stuff. And if you read his description here, he says, um, for those interested, it's basically measure curvature, use that as a mask to displace slash advect along the gradient and vel field. So this vel field presumably is just like a curl noise that he's using, uh, which can be similar to the vel field that we're using. And then he's using the curvature and the gradient both generated by the SDF to do this cool kind of uh, growth simulation here. Um, and we can try to do the same thing. So over here, I've basically already set that up and we can kind of see what my setup does. And it's a bit different from Ian's, but 
um, it still is a cool growth setup that I'm, I'm pretty happy with and, you know, am enjoying messing with. Um, and, you know, you can, you can mesh it after and you get this really cool kind of almost like creating like a structure that looks kind of like a human brain shape or something with all these kind of neat folds and stuff in it. Um, and this flattening here is happening where it's like hitting the edge of the velocity field. So if you don't want that to happen, just kind of make a bigger velocity field that isn't limited by these bounds. So this is, this is pretty sweet and I'll, I'll break down kind of like how this is working again in sort of more granular detail than what Ian was saying on the, uh, the file that he posted. Um, so basically what we're doing is the right input here again is feeding in that same velocity grid stuff that we had before. And the left side is just feeding in this basic little sphere with some noise on it, uh, turned into an SDF. Um, and so that goes in the left, the right side is the velocity and the main key core part of this is just this VDV advex node. So if we play this again, we'll see this is what's sort of pushing the shape along and, and, and that's cool. Um, but um, what Ian was also doing that was cool was integrating, again, two things, the curvature and the gradient that we're getting from this SDF. Those are two things that you can calculate from a SDF volume um, just sort of using the information that it has in it already. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know what a SDF is or is kind of lost on the stuff, I've made a pretty old tutorial on my YouTube channel that you can check out. That's all about uh, volumes, VDBs, SDFs, uh, density grids, um, and uh, that will hopefully kind of help explain that. It's linked right over here. I'll link it in the description below also, but um, it's just called Voxels, Volumes, and VDBs, Volume Meshing Workflows and Houdini for Beginners. So once you know what an SDF is, uh, it's just like a float grid of saying basically, here's the distance that I am from the surface, positive and negative. And from that, you can generate what is called a gradient, uh, which is a velocity vector um, that is sort of pointing out from that. So it's taking sort of all of the points on this 3D grid that's making up, that's describing where the surface is, and it's sort of uh, pointing out along from the inside to the outside, creating essentially normals for your uh, SDF volume. Um, and so that's cool. And that can be used if we look in here, um, I'm calculating that, um, I'll just, uh, comment out the curvature stuff here. Um, and you can see I'm, I'm basically, I'm, I'm calculating that by just using this volume gradient vex here. Um, you can do this with VOPs and like other ways too. You could also use a VDB analysis to uh, create a gradient from your um, surface here. So you can see the gradient is creating a vector from a scalar input um, by measuring sort of like what is like the flowing distance from negative to positive uh, on this sort of grid. Um, and so here I'm just basically saying with this function, uh, take the velocity and add to the velocity um, the volume gradient of this second input, which is actually the, th the third input on here. Um, uh, so measure the volume gradient of the third input. It's measuring the you know first volume, so zero, volume zero, on that input, which is the surface here. Um, and it's just saying return to me basically what the gradient is for each position on the grid, which is why we're using the, the P attribute here. Um, and then I'm multiplying that by 0.1. And if, if we do that, you'll see now our volume is gonna kind of grow out along the gradient and just continue to kind of expand forever. So that's pretty sweet. And we're modifying this velocity uh, 
velocity field now by adding a little bit of this volume gradient, but I'm multiplying by 0.1 to make it so it's not like too strong. If I get rid of that, it'll grow really, really fast. And we don't want that. So I'm just gonna multiply it by 0.1 and it will be a little bit more manageable and smooth and nice. Um, so that's cool, um, but it's not that interesting on its own. Um, so one other thing that you can do with this VDB analysis uh, is measure the curvature of your SDF. Um, and so here what it's doing is, I believe it's basically saying, you know, take the SDF, measure the curvature, and it's feeding out values that are, it's a scalar to scalar. So it's going from these, you know, I'm negative one distance from the surface, I'm positive one distance from the surface, and it's saying, uh, take those and calculate like how curve am I by measuring like my value relative to my neighboring voxels, I'm assuming. Um, I don't totally know, but the point is that it gives you these values for curvature. And I believe the values will generally be like, if it's curving out, if it's like a convex curvature, it'll be positive values. It'll be like, uh, you know, up to like positive 33 if it's really curvy. Um, and if it's negative, it's, if it's concave, it'll be negative values. Um, and so what we want is to basically just say, uh, if you are negative or if you're flat, I think don't um, push this, don't advect this along the velocity or the gradient. Um, and if you're positive, then you can kind of push it out if you want um, so that the curvy bits kind of keep growing out. Um, so to do that, I'm just gonna then say, first we add the, the volume gradient stuff here. We, we add the gradient to the velocity. And then over here, we multiply the velocity by the curvature by saying vel times equals um, basically volume sample uh, and volume sample this curvature uh, volume, which is now the only one in here. Um, volume sample this, um, uh, the second input, so input one, um, the first volume in it, so that's zero, and then sample it at each position. Um, so then uh, if we do that right out of the gate, we get this really crazy result that apparently takes a really long time to calculate um, where it's going to be like pushing in any bits that are have negative curvature, negative curvature. It's gonna be pushing out any bits that have any positive curvature. Um, and this is already just going really, really slow. So I'm not even gonna bother letting this keep playing. Um, but there's a few things that we can do with this. We can, we can remap the curvature or we could clamp it. Um, but I'm gonna go with remapping it using a fit range. And so we're saying, let's fit it and let's assume that it's like uh, maybe like negative five, we'll say is the minimum and maybe positive 10, we'll say is the maximum and we'll fit it between zero and one. So it's multiplying the velocity by, uh, by zero in the areas where it's negative five or below and it's multiplying the velocity by one in any areas where it's uh, you know, positive 10 or above. And in between, it's just sort of like linearly interpolating between those two values. Um, so that's cool. And if we go over here now and we hit play, now we get this crazy growth situation happening. And so this is kind of cool. It's like following the stuff and it's, it's growing out more where there's more curvature, but it's also a bit messy. Um, and you know, since we're working with SDFs, there's all kinds of handy SDF operations we can be doing. So I just figured let's add a VDB smooth at the end here. Um, and we can try these different kinds of techniques for it, but I just wanted to add a little bit of smoothing. And remember it's doing this every single frame. So you don't want to add like too much smoothing because then it's just going to kind of disappear or, or, or not really grow out very much. So I'm just going to use a little bit of smoothing um, and I'll hit play. And then we end up with this pretty snazzy result where we get this nice, cool, smooth growth stuff happening here.
Um, so I, I really like this a lot. I think this is like a pretty sweet effect. Um, and if we play it like that, you know, that's kind of cool. It's a cool, cool kind of growth setup. Um, but there's definitely more stuff we can do, and there's definitely more ways you can mess with this, and you could add in, you know, dilate or erode nodes if you want, or you could, um, I don't know, do all kinds of other cool things. Um, uh, you could change the ranges, you could, you could play with all these kinds of settings. Um, but also, keep in mind, what we've been doing here for a while is modifying the velocity of the, uh, of this like kind of input over here. So this, this, um, this velocity here, which we've done this project non-divergent step on to help kind of remove any divergence. Well, now that we're adding the gradient back into it, uh, we essentially are getting some divergence back in there. And we're also, you know, um, uh, adding in, uh, the like we're multiplying in the curvature stuff which is also messing with it so maybe we want to project non-divergent inside the solver every frame um and just to kind of illustrate this further you know you can you can imagine that like let's say we have the curve kind of growing out like this you know and there's 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 bits that are growing like this or whatever well since these are growing out along the gradient right this is essentially what the gradient is um, of this thing, uh, in these areas, right, we would be getting some amount of negative divergence because we're, we have this kind of compression that's coming together. Um, so if we do a project non-divergent step here, we'll be sort of removing some of that, uh, divergence and resulting in kind of a little bit in theory, a little bit of a more fluid sort of swirly simulation. So I'll just add a project non-divergent node right here to modify this guy every single frame. Um, and um, then I'm gonna set the iterations because this, is, this has got a thousand iterations in it and it has to do that every single frame. It's gonna be kind of slow. Um, so let's just do a lower number like one or something just to get a little bit of divergence removed from there. Um, and it does calculate slower for sure, but I think it ends up resulting in like a little bit more interesting movement. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, the difference between adding the uh, project non-divergence in here and not adding it is subtle, um, but I've cached it out twice. You can see this is without um, and it kind of fills up faster, and then this is this is with, and I, I think it gives it a little bit more of a kind of swirly motion, um, but uh, it's subtle, and, and I also don't think it's totally. I don't think it's clearing out like uh, all of the divergence. Um, it's only doing one iteration, but uh, it's fun to play with and it's a cool thing to know about and uh, hopefully it can help you in your future Houdini endeavors. And I'll include a link to the hip file for this, which will just be sitting on my gum road for anyone to grab and mess around with. Uh, thanks for watching and see you again soon.